An object which is at the same place all the time but appears to be tumbling. Well, we've had it ever since yesterday. It just seems to be tagging along with us. We weren't about to do that because uh, we know that uh, the, those transmissions would be heard by all sorts of people and uh, uh, who knows what somebody would have demanded that we uh, turn back because of aliens or whatever the reason is. So we, we didn't do that, but we did uh, decide we'd, we'd just cautiously ask uh, Houston where, how far away was the S4B? Unaware of the drama unfolding in space, Mission Control radioed the position back to Apollo 11. Apollo 11, Houston, the S-4B is about 6,000 nautical miles from you now, over. And a few moments later, why well, they came back and said something like it was 6,000 miles away because of the maneuver. So we, we really didn't think we were looking at something that far away. So we decided uh, that after a while of watching it, uh, we, it was time to go to sleep and not to talk about it anymore until we came back in, in debriefing. To this day, whatever it was the crew saw has never been positively identified or officially acknowledged. The possibility that you might encounter aliens in space uh, has to be considered in a very sensible and positive and realistic way. Um, there are a lot of people within the program who went off later and became convinced that UFOs existed. And that led to some concern on NASA's part where they got the agreement of the crew never to publicly talk about these things for fear of ridicule. But there is another side to Cooper's lifetime in aviation. One that for years he would only discuss with close friends until now. It involves his personal encounters with UFOs. For him, it began in 1951 while flying in Europe for the U.S. Air Force. There, Cooper and other pilots witnessed an incident that has never been officially explained. A vast armada of UFOs flying in formation at extremely high altitudes. Recently, Yolanda Gaskin spoke with Gordon Cooper. In this exclusive interview, Colonel Cooper spoke for the first time on television about his encounters with UFOs. I read about this incident you had in 1951, and you said you saw literally hundreds of unidentifiable flying objects. Yes, they were flying quite high. How high, we couldn't tell because we couldn't get anywhere near their altitude. But they were either very large craft way up or smaller craft still well above what we could get to. For a day and a half, all of this happened. But then no one wanted to talk about it. Well, we sent a report forward on it, and, and the answer that finally came back months later was they were probably high-flying seed pods, which didn't sound very logical. There are always a lot of excuses. There's always um, the weather balloons. I've heard that one before. Oh, yeah. In yeah. 1951, you couldn't even get close to That's the things that were flying overhead. You or anyone else that was flying. They were faster, higher. Six years later, Cooper again encountered a UFO. This one definitely was not a weather balloon. While supervising flight testing at Edwards Air Force Base, his military camera crew actually filmed an unidentified saucer-shaped object landing near the site. As they were sitting there filming, a little saucer came from, uh, I say little saucer, it was a saucer, came flying over their heads, put down three little landing gear and landed right out on the dry lake bed. And they picked up their cameras and started over toward it filming as they went. And when they got in fairly close to it, it lifted up, put the gear back in the wheel wells, tipped up, and took off at a great rate of speed. And so they brought the, came into my office and told me what had happened, and I sent them over to develop the film, and then had to go through the, all the proper regulations of reporting this, and, and we wound up having to send the film forward to Washington in the uh, base jet airplane, and uh, I don't know whether anyone's ever seen it since. 
Now, the vehicle that you just described, how similar was it to the very first sighting that you had back in 1951? Quite similar. It was basically the same plan form vehicle. They were a double saucer, lenticular. But if you're going to be going in and out of atmospheres like Earth or other places might have, you certainly need a little more aerodynamic type of vehicle. And the saucer has the capability of going through the air at tremendous rates of speed and handling the bow and trailing wave without making shock waves. So it can be very silent while traveling at big rates of speed through the atmosphere. But sightings of UFOs weren't limited to the military. Cooper has commercial airline colleagues who've also seen UFOs. Yes, a friend of mine who's a captain on a major airline uh, at night was flying along, noticed this suddenly a big glow came off his left wing and, and he looked out and his big saucer was sitting right off their wing and so he turned slightly toward and it moved away and turned back and it moved back in position and turned to his co-pilot and said uh, do you see what I see and he said oh god yeah I do and it trailed along with him for quite a period of time and tipped up and climbed very steeply away it was on Jim McDivitt's Gemini 7 mission where they saw um, this glint of something metallic off in the distance and he reported and nobody had it listed on the ground so he tried getting a picture of it but the sun unfortunately was glinting off of it so bright all you got is just a glint there was no detail on what it was but never any uh, any further sighting at all on it years later cooper approached the united nations with a proposal for a committee that would explore the ufo phenomenon all right now tell me about the letter to the u.n well, the letter to the UN was uh, in conjunction with a meeting that I had with uh, Kurt Waldheim and the Security Council of the UN to try to encourage the UN to establish a committee to start comparing notes and data and information and to really look into all of this from an unbiased, neutral point of view. Here's a quote from, from your letter. I believe that these extraterrestrial vehicles and their crews are visiting this planet from other planets and are obviously a little more advanced than we are here on Earth. And are you saying that's exactly why governments have been trying to keep this information private because of that obvious advancement? Well, apparently it's one of the better flying airplanes. Milton Torres is not the kind of guy to tell a tall tale. 20 years in the Air Force, an engineer with a PhD, a professor. He's all about brass tacks and left brain thinking. So I was all ears when he started talking about his UFO encounter over England in May of 1957. I got scrambled one night and my first orders are, you will be ordered to fire on this mission. In just a few minutes, he was over the North Sea in a fighter like this at 31,000 feet, traveling nearly the speed of sound. In the dark and in the clouds, Milton saw the strongest signal he had ever seen on his radar screen. Bigger than sh the target was there, and the target looked like an aircraft carrier. It was that big and on the, my screen. He flew toward it to try and shoot it down. And it takes off like you're just standing like still. I wasn't even there. Like, I wasn't even there. Just gone. Milton has no earthly explanation for what he saw. Could it have been a problem with the radar? Could it have been a weather phenomenon? No. Could it have been a meteor? It, Any of those it, things? It, it, everything was explained to me already. Yeah? I knew what it was. it was. It was some design of an aircraft by some space alien. Milton Torres says a U.S. intelligence agent ordered him to keep his mouth shut. The odd encounter is one of hundreds of once classified UFO sightings released last month by the British government. It's the sort of disclosure UFO investigators are demanding from the U.S. government. How would people react? Well, it would be kind of good. It's about time. Former astronaut Edgar Mitchell is the sixth man to walk on the moon and a firm believer that aliens have visited our planet repeatedly. So I had to ask... Why are they coming in these little glancing visits and, and we, we haven't had a more meaningful dialogue or contact or attempt to communicate with these Well, people? I think we have. Really? I think, I think we have, but it is not common knowledge. Mitchell told me after he returned from the moon, he was briefed at the Pentagon by a high-ranking officer, whose name he would not reveal, who said the U.S. government does have evidence of alien spacecraft and is keeping it a secret. Well, I think the root of the reason is still a secret is power and control, controlling whatever technology exists.
I fully believe that uh, we're not alone and have for many, many years, even though but at the time I went to the moon, it was the conventional wisdom, both in science and theology, that we were alone in the universe. We're just barely out of the trees, even though we think we're rather sophisticated. But I do like to tell the story that my great-grandparents came across from southern United States to the west after our Civil War. And I went to the moon yes, less than 100 years later. They came across in covered wagons. So from covered wagons to going to the moon in less than 100 years in our lifetime is a rather significant event that tells us how primitive we have been until the modern era, and we're still pr rather primitive. Uh, because of my uh, openness to these things, I did have many of the old timers in the military and in the uh, intelligence community over the years wanting to get it off their chest before they passed away uh, allowed me to interview them and talk to them about it. And so my ideas became fairly well solidified in the fact we've been visited. We have to remember that right after World War II, the Army Air Force was separated and became the, Ar became the Air Force, a separate branch of service. And that the OSS, which was the Office of Special Services, was disbanded and eventually became the CIA. So that here was a major military organization and a major intelligence organization, totally in disarray, new founded, didn't know what they were doing after World War II and not really reorganized yet. And as a result of that, the President Truman at that time, um, convened a very high-level uh, committee to examine this alien or UFO phenomenon. They did come to the conclusion that it was alien, and the military uh, rightly came to the conclusion, if, this, if they're hostile, there's nothing we can do about it. Therefore, their choice was to deny it and to hush it up and create a, the National Security Act of 1947 which validated that uh, uh, deception and covered it up and allowed the group to go underground, as it were. And we've been living with that now for 50 years. It is really the uh, beginning of the whole cover-up, the, the entire denial of this phenomenon. And uh, the addition of dismissal, disinformation, misinformation, uh, to cloak and to discourage uh, investigation, to misinform. It's just been continuous for many, many years now. Eventually it came away from the fear, I believe, of uh, not being able to protect and do their duty to uh, the notion of power and control, controlling the knowledge and the technology. And the group involved with that is still doing it. We have created our reality here and we have created it right now rather badly, for it's not a sustainable reality. We have created with our science and technology, instead of using it for the greater good, it's been captured by uh, interest, greed, self-service, uh, which is rife. And instead of using it, all of our technology and our brilliance and genius for greater good, we, we use it for self-service. And that's not going to work. It's important that we look at our civilization, our place in history, use our tools of science for greater understanding, to promote the greater good, and that's what it's all about. The Russian equivalent of Cape Canaveral is called Star City. Until recently, it was closed to outsiders and jealously guarded its outer space secrets. But in the wake of Glosnost, a sightings investigative team was invited to Star City. And when we got there, the first cosmonaut we spoke with told us that he had just had an encounter with a UFO. Sightings went to investigate cosmonaut sightings of UFOs. Sightings similar to those reported by American astronauts, but dismissed by American scientists. A lot of things we see on the pictures in space are things we're used to seeing here in the control center down here in Houston. 
uh, they're ordinary events that surround the spaceship. Pieces coming off, uh, water dumps, pieces of ice, insulation. There's little pieces 10, maybe 20 feet away from the camera. But within the Soviet space program, cosmonauts insist that they have seen more than just floating scraps of space junk. I think that we are not alone in the universe. I believe that someone or something of extraterrestrial origin has visited Earth. In April of 1979, cosmonaut Viktor Afanasyev lifted off from Star City to dock with the Soviet Solyut 6 space station. But while en route, something strange happened. Cosmonaut Afanasyev saw an unidentified object turn toward his craft and begin tailing it through space. It followed us during half of our orbit. We observed it on the light side, and when we entered the shadow side, it disappeared completely. It was an engineering structure made from some type of metal, approximately 40 meters long with inner holes. The object was narrow here and wider here, and inside there were openings. Some places had projections like small wings. The object stayed very close to us. We photographed it, and our photos showed it to be 23 to 28 meters away. In addition to photographing the UFO, Afanasiev continually reported back to mission control about the craft's size, its shape, and position. When the cosmonaut returned to Earth, he was debriefed, told never to reveal what he knew, and had his cameras and film confiscated. Those photos and his voice transmissions from space have never been released. It is only now, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, that Afanasyev feels he can safely tell his story. It is still classified as a UFO, because we have yet to identify the object. Spaceflight itself broadens your horizons to the point which you kind of open up to possibility.